I'm not doing this. What, what, what are you doing? I'm getting out of here. But you can't. I had a whole thing planned. Look, George, my channel mascot that only people on Twitter know about. I love you. I love you too. And I bet it took you a while to set all of this up, but... It's all so done at this point. What do you mean? It's just that every time a reviewer or a video essayist make a video about Saw, it, there's always a framing device like this. What? With the bathroom and everything? Yeah. Hell, even I've done it before. In a video that none of you will ever see. Who are you talking to? I don't know. Well, I'm sorry. I thought you would like it. And I do. It's just that... Like, what's the point of doing it anymore? I think it's interesting though. What is? You know that so many people role-play as Jigsaw victims just for the fun of it. They didn't have to do it to talk about Saw, but they wanted to. Yeah. You know what? That actually is interesting. I mean, for all the shit that these films have been getting throughout the years, there are apparently a lot of people who seem to really like them. I mean, really like them. So the Saw films are actually good then? Not just so bad they become good. I'm not sure if I know how to answer that, George, but you know what? We're gonna get to the bottom of it right now. Finally, I'm gonna try to explain to myself and everyone else, once and for all, why the Saw films aren't just good, but secretly great. Title drop. What? Oh look, I'm here now! Funny how continuity works. The Saw films are many different things. One of those things is a horror-themed soap opera, so the task of quickly summarizing them for those who aren't already in the know isn't going to be easy. Even so, I'm going to try. If you don't want the recap, you can just skip to the timestamp over here, but that would mean that you would see less of me, and... I mean, I would count that as a loss. No matter how alive or dead he happens to be in any given film, the plot is always anchored to the character of John Kramer, the Jigsaw Killer. Kramer used to be a successful civil engineer, with a passion for helping the less fortunate in society. His most famous accomplishment, the Urban Renewal Group, aimed to claim abandoned properties and rebuild them as low-income housing. Kramer also aided his wife, Jill Tuck, in opening a recovery clinic for struggling drug addicts. One of these addicts, Cecil Adams, slammed a door onto Jill's very pregnant belly as he was robbing the clinic, which resulted in a miscarriage. On top of this, Kramer was diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer, feeling like he's lost everything, most of all his will to live. He attempts to take his own life by driving off a cliff. Miraculously, he survives, after which he decides to spend the remainder of his days, quote, testing the fabric of human nature which apparently is civil engineer speak for putting people in elaborate death traps, forcing them to either mutilate their bodies, someone else's, or both. His targets consist of the same people he previously wanted to help, drug addicts, as well as criminals and people who he generally believes don't appreciate their lives. In a twisted way, he still thinks that he's helping people, or rather that his new method is what will actually help rehabilitate them. He earns the title of the Jigsaw Killer because he removes a section of skin, in the shape of a jigsaw puzzle piece, from the victims who don't survive his tests. Those who he claims lack their survival instinct, which according to him is the most vital piece of the human puzzle. The Jigsaw Killer isn't just one person though. Throughout the series, we are introduced to apprentices, accomplices, and even a copycat. Well, two if we count that one time when Hoffman made a deadly pendulum masquerading as a jigsaw trap. But he was recruited afterwards, so we'll just call that an audition. Are you all hyped about this year's jigsaw tryouts? <laughs>
This is why, despite ultimately being killed by the end of Saw 3, along with his closest ally and former victim Amanda Young, Kramer's work continues for an additional six films. There might be even more depending on when you're watching this video. The mantle of main antagonist, at least in a physical sense, is then picked up by the aforementioned Mark Hoffman, who conveniently side hustles as a police detective. Creating a problem only to lie about solving it? Is that symbolism I'm smelling? It sure is, but we'll get back to that later. I know it looks delicious, but please have some patience. While not generally making traps completely unwinnable, like Young, Hoffman spares no sympathy for the people he captures, and shows little restraint when it comes to violence. When he's finally revealed to be Jigsaw's successor, he brutally stabs and burns the FBI agents who figured it out, along with the evidence. It's already too late, though. The rest of the department already knows. He retreats to one of his lairs, where Jill Tuck forcibly puts him in a trap. Kramer never gave him a test of his own, so in his last will and testament, he asks Jill to take care of it for him. Hoffman manages to survive and makes it his sole mission to take revenge on Jill. He even goes so far that he completely assassins Creed's his way through a police station in order to get to her. He then puts her in a trap, similar to the one she used on him, the infamous reverse bear trap from the first film, the deadly effect of which is finally shown. After Jill has died, Hoffman is overwhelmed and captured by a group of Jigsaw survivors, led by none other than one of Jigsaw's most secret assets, Dr. Lawrence Gordon, the main protagonist who survived the first film. Gordon takes Hoffman to the horribly disgusting bathroom where he was tested, locks him up, and leaves him to rot. This is how what was supposed to be the last Saw film ends. But then, seven years later, there was another sequel, where yet another secret member of Team Jigsaw is revealed, in the form of Dr. Logan Nelson. Logan got the attention of Kramer when he was retconned into mistakenly mixing up the x-ray that revealed Kramer's brain tumor. His mistake served him a visit to Jill Tuck's lethal family farm, where Kramer made the mistake of giving Logan too much of his sleepy drugs, making him almost die before he had a chance to play Jigsaw's game. To prove to himself that he's a worthy successor to Kramer, and to take revenge on the corrupt cop who he blames for the death of his wife, Logan recreates that same game, at the same farm, close to a decade later, where he also tries out a new catchphrase for Jigsaw. I speak for the dead. It doesn't stick. Lastly, we have Spiral, from The Book of Saw, a spin-off starring Chris Rock in the main role. I mention this only because, despite fellow cast members claiming that he is a police officer named Zeke, he's basically just playing the public persona of Chris Rock. I kid you not, this film contains completely tangential scenes where Chris Rock is simply let loose to perform stand-up comedy. Who the fuck is nicer than Forrest Gump? His best friend was a nigga and a white boy with no legs! You can give a woman 600 Tuesdays. It ain't worth three Saturday nights. Women cheat in the daytime. <laughs> you can get away with a lot of shit in the daytime. One day, your wife will be angry because you couldn't go to her sister's birthday dinner. Yeah, as soon as she got aged, she's like, hey, Forrest. Mind you, it's mostly comedy and name only. This time around, a jigsaw copycat killer is specifically going after corrupt cops. Not in an effort to reform the police force, but simply to get rid of the bad eggs, birthed out of a piece of vaguely explained police legislation called Article 8. The clearest description of this article we get is that it made cops dirtier, or allowed them to be dirtier, and way more trigger happy. In the end, Chris has to decide between joining the copycat killer, who turns out to be his partner, Detective William Schenk, or save his father and former police chief, who enforced Article 8 in the first place. Chris chooses the latter, resulting in his father being killed and Schenk escaping. Okay, so this video is about explaining why these films are secretly great, but honestly, Spiral fucking sucks. <laughs> Not only is it such a milk toast attempt to talk about police violence, the scene where we establish who Chris's character actually is unironically contains almost every single cop movie cliche you can think of. You are off on your own as usual, no backup, nothing. There's nobody on the force, I can stop it up! You're gonna learn to be a team player. Me no one, no partner! Just because your dad was Chief fucking Marcus Banks doesn't mean you get out of this shit. Twelve years ago, I turned in a dirty cop. 
I got a heat wave going on. We got rolling blackouts. The city is nuts. Zeke, I want you to meet detective in training, William Shank. He was the top of his academy, so don't screw this up. What? You're not gonna squeeze in that he's two weeks from retirement as well? Fucking hell. Keep in mind that I've now told you the general plot of the whole franchise, yet I've barely told you anything at all about the majority of the people who are put into Jigsaw's traps. This is what I mean when I say that the Saw series is like a soap opera. There are multiple stories happening all at once, some are told episodically from film to film, others are more or less isolated to one film, and others are merely Saw-related shorts with little to no connection to the other plots. The films will frantically jump between the genres of body horror, police procedurals, and even family melodrama, with a significant hint of social commentary sprinkled throughout. During the heyday of the franchise, it very much felt like going to the cinema to see a new episode of a convoluted TV show once a year. In some regard, making it the precursor to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, funny enough. However, all those parts, no matter how insignificant or exploitative they may seem, are no less important to the allure of the Saw films, or to their underlying message. The Saw films are many different things. One of those things is a vehicle for actor Tobin Bell to be one of the genuinely scariest antagonists to ever grace the silver screen. When I said in the previous part that the plot always comes back to John Kramer, it's because the filmmakers realized that Bell was so bloody good in the role that, after John Kramer died in Saw 3, they kept bringing him back for the sequels anyway. Not only does he frequently show up in flashbacks, his distorted, grave voice introduces, via video and audio tapes, almost every single trap throughout the franchise. We've all said something like, oh I could listen to that person read through the phone book. Jigsaw is the kind of guy that quote was made for. Not only would his voice make every number sound like the most important thing you'd hear all day, Along with his amazingly creepy puppet, he would make the whole phone book fucking terrifying. Hello, Amanda. You don't know me, but I know you. At the same time, you can't help but love him, to an extent. Tobin Bell brings the same amount of energy to the role of Jigsaw as Robert England does to Freddy Krueger. Or Anthony Hopkins brings to Odin. It's one thing to make a character with a reprehensible sense of morality likable to make their stance sound convincing, even for a second, is another thing entirely. Jigsaw enthralls you not with the horrible things he's suggesting, but how he suggests it. Freddy Krueger doesn't see himself as morally superior to anyone, and he sure as hell couldn't convince your average Joe that his dream-killing antics are in any way justifiable. Jigsaw, on the other hand, does see himself as morally superior, and if you're not careful enough, he might convince you that he is. That's what makes him so delightfully evil. I would obviously hate to be in this situation, but I can't wait to hear Jigsaw tell this person how fucked they are. You are predators, but today you become the prey. <laughs> yeah, you tell him. Now arguably, the main attraction is the traps, and it's easy to put a negative spin on why that is which is why a lot of critics at the time did. David Edelstein popularized the term torture porn back in 2006 when he criticized films like Saw, Hostel, and even Passion of the Christ for being so viciously nihilistic that the only point seems to be to force you to suspend moral judgment altogether. Make no mistake, these are not the words of some worried but clueless parent trying to cause a moral panic. In the same article, Edelstein describes himself as a horror maven. Personally, I feel like he was concerned in a this is a development I'm not entirely sure I'm comfortable with type of way. The way you'd expect a parent to not be immediately on board with something like TikTok. Even calling it torture porn while clearly intending it to be a derogatory label isn't completely off the mark. In 1991, Linda Williams wrote an essay called Film Bodies, Gender, Genre and Excess, where she coined a similar term, body genre, referring to films which focus on the bodies rather than the minds of both the participants in the story and its audience. According to Williams, the body genre mainly consists of melodrama, horror, and yes, pornography, gratuitous emotions, gratuitous violence and terror, and gratuitous sex, as she puts it. 
Sure, the sexual aspect of the Saw films might mostly be subtextual, except for this dream sequence in which Hoffman literally penetrates Jill with a pointy death machine. It's so obvious that I hesitate to even call it a metaphor for hate fucking. Regardless, Williams' words feel pretty damn descriptive of the Saw franchise as a whole. Williams, more so than Edelstein, also posits that the type of titulation the body genre offers may have a deeper value. A filmmaker's intention for having a masked murderer killing off a younger female character might primarily be to excite and frighten the audience. But it also, as Williams puts it, raises the anxiety of not being ready for a sexual encounter, which frequently happen to be the circumstance around which classic slasher film murders take place. Similarly, the main purpose of the body horror in the Saw films is to disgust and scare, but that's not all it does. More importantly, it also feeds a morbid curiosity. It's an odd thing to wonder, just for the sake of it, what happens to a human body when it's literally torn to shreds. However, considering that the Saw franchise is one of the most successful horror movie franchises of all time according to the box office, it's a thing a lot of people have wondered about. So-called torture porn presents the audience with a safe space where they can experience flesh, blood, and death without it causing any real-life harm to any party involved. Or as author Caitlin Starling puts it, Body horror is, in some ways, the easy option. It hurts, it disgusts by definition. We all have bodies, and the entry fee of embodied is the certainty, not the risk. The certainty that eventually, something will go wrong with it. We will lose control of it, we will suffer indignities large and small. We will at some point, at multiple points, have to refine what it is to be ourselves as our bodies change in the ways we can't predict. And even when everything is working normally, there is still little horrors that we learn to welcome. Pregnancies, painful growth spurts, aging. That familiarity is what makes body horror such visceral, overwhelming and powerful tool in storytelling. It's a knee-jerk, gut-level reaction. It can flint open barriers between author and reader. It can be transcendent in its extremely physical reality. To accompany a character through their suffering is to get to know them intimately. For more on this, I highly recommend you check out Yara Zaid's video on the catharsis of body horror. It's really good. Starling's quote can be applied to any body horror film though. So what makes the Saw film so special? I think it comes down to the specific context in which Jigsaw's death devices are used. Jigsaw mainly uses three words to describe the situations he puts his victims through. Tests, traps, and most importantly, games. The supposed intention is for a victim to be metaphorically reborn, to embrace and appreciate all of life's blessings. But to do so, there is a game that needs to be won. A game that, more often than not, demands to be beaten during a set amount of time. If the time runs out, it's game over. The protagonist, or somebody else, dies. The allure of Saw isn't just the gore but the build-up to the gore. There's genuine tension in knowing exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. It's like a more bloody version of opening your presents at Christmas. <laughs> that, that was, uh, that was ad-libbed. <laughs> and when the game often poorly ends, it does so in a very video gamey way, with what can be equated to a cutscene, pun intended, where we witness the brutal demise or death animation of the victim. The part of your brain that likes to play never dies. It's the reason why adults still play board games, party games, drinking games, Dungeons and Dragons. Hell, it's the reason why we play sports. It's no wonder then why there are saw themed escape rooms. Why content creators like myself find some entertainment in recreating the bathroom trap from the first film. The Netflix show Squid Game became a huge success for very similar reasons. YouTuber Mr. Beast and even Netflix themselves wanted to recreate the show in real life. And it sure as hell wasn't because they really vibed with its blatant message of anti-capitalism because... A lot of people didn't seem to catch that part. The Saw films are like classic fables. Cautionary tales. You come for the traps, but what ultimately sticks with you is the message of cherishing your life. 
You absolutely shouldn't agree with Jigsaw's methods, but even if you've never committed some terrible crime that can be directly compared to one of his victims, their situations and personal experiences will likely make you think about how you're living your life. Maybe you have been acting carelessly. Maybe you do take people for granted. Maybe there is something that would make Jigsaw want to put you in a trap. I think Tobin Bell himself said it best. You know, those kids, a teacher could sit them in a classroom and tell them not to move and say, Today we are going to talk about appreciating your blessings. And they'd be like, Oh God. That kind of thing. For some reason in Saw, there's so much energy and mayhem going on around it, and then all of a sudden out of the blue comes this little message that comes through and they remember that. People learn in different ways and the environment in which something is said makes it resonate sometimes, and sometimes it just puts you to sleep. The Saw films don't ask for your attention. They demand it. And if you listen, there might be something genuinely valuable to learn from them. At least in terms of self-improvement. Now originally, this video was supposed to end somewhere around this point, but... I just couldn't fucking stop myself, now could I? Hello, dear audience. It's me, the real Jigsaw. I want to play a game with all of you to ensure the survival of this YouTube channel. I implore you to click on this link in the video description and support Pim's Crypt on Patreon. In return, you will receive several fine rewards, such as being able to watch all future videos earlier than everyone else, access to a Patreon-exclusive podcast, as well as the official Discord server. All this and more for at least one dollar a month. So ask yourself, how much is this channel worth? Let it live or die. Make your choice. The Saw films are too many things. If you pull one thread, a tangled ball of yarn will inevitably follow. The praise I gave to these films in the previous part still stands, obviously, but I used to find it impossible to speak so fondly of them without adding the longest list of caveats. That's what made me wonder why I really like these films. If I do it only because my surface level enjoyment makes me turn off specific parts of my critically thinking brain. I finally realized that this is what the video needs to be about. I had to figure it all out, solve the true mystery of the Saw films. I read two books while working on this video. I barely ever read books. And I study at uni! Once again, it all comes down to John Kramer. And more specifically, the persona of Jigsaw. Depending on how you read this character, he can be a representation of God, or religious figures in general, enacting divine justice and punishment onto those who deviate from what he considers to be the morally correct path. His work continues even after his death, through his disciples. And one of the films is even called From the Book of Saw, obviously alluding to biblical texts. Kramer also claims to be able to perfectly predict human behavior. In his own words, he leaves nothing to chance, almost as if the lives of his victims are predestined by his design. Jigsaw can also be read as the physical embodiment of the surveillance state, the way he has eyes and ears everywhere, sitting on information that would seem impossible for a regular civilian to acquire. Somehow he finds out the identity of the only witness of a car crash, despite there being no testimony how much money was stolen from the wallet of a complete stranger, and that his neighbor made it look like her husband suffocated their infant child in his sleep. Jigsaw never guesses anything. He knows. He always knows. Other slasher type horror films are equally open to interpretation, but the Saw films ask you to make your interpretations an active part of the movie watching experience. Saw 2, 3, and 4 especially invite the viewer as well as the characters, to see and feel what Jigsaw sees and feels about his victims, encouraging you to put yourself in the shoes of both the protagonists and the people they have to absolve or punish. Saw 4 is the most explicit about this, due to Jigsaw having literally named and thematically linked every trap with phrases like, see what I see, feel what I feel, and finally, judge as I judge. You, as an audience member, are challenged to consider Jigsaw's viewpoints and how they relate both to you and to society as a whole. 
The most worrying reading, I feel, is the one that conflates the generally positive message of appreciating your life with Jigsaw's methods being somewhat or even completely morally justified. That he is, to some extent, making societal changes that politicians and the police can't but should make. I'm here to tell you that the reason why the Saw films are secretly great is because the underlying message of this franchise is, in actuality, the polar opposite of this reading. Not only is Jigsaw wrong, he fails. A lot. Kramer's transition to Jigsaw is a transition of political radicalization. His work with the Urban Renewal Group and Jill's Recovery Clinic suggests a liberal or even a slightly more left-leaning political stance. He wanted to use his own societal privilege in a way that he thought would make things better for those who are less fortunate. The low-income housing he built tells us that he was aware of the struggles of the working and lower socioeconomic classes, and that he maybe didn't expect poor people to magically make their own lives better. When he became the Jigsaw, that part of his ideology was more or less thrown out the window. As Jigsaw, he is individualistic. Darwinistic. The kind of guy who would unironically tell you to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. That it's all about the survival of the fittest. He still believes that he's helping people, but only because he's giving them the tools to quote, help themselves. There is this notion that's been uncritically regurgitated for well over a decade, even by fans of the films, that Jigsaw has never really killed anyone, that it's his victims who are doing it, that they are wholly responsible for their actions before, during, and after Jigsaw's games, whereas the man himself lacks almost any and all accountability for their deaths or trauma. This is simply wrong, and I sincerely wish people would stop saying it. There are plenty of examples of Jigsaw kidnapping people and putting them in traps where one or several people will inevitably die, making him extremely accountable for not just the kidnappings, but every single one of those deaths. That's how Jigsaw views himself though, as being above blame, above the law, and above the societal institutions who failed him. Jigsaw is a right-wing vigilante. Plain and simple. Or, as pointed out by Mei Leitz of Nixphere's fame, he's really just a cop. He seeks out and captures what he sees as bad guys, no matter how petty the reason might be, and enacts his own twisted form of justice upon them. In Saw 6, he puts an older man in a trap, simply for being a smoker with a history of high blood pressure. And the conceit of the trap is that he's supposed to hold his breath to survive. From an audience perspective, it's a piece of poetic justice with the purpose of warning you about the consequences of smoking. A little overdone and on the nose, but whatever. Although, from an in-universe perspective, this man is unfairly forced to compete against a younger, non-smoker for a chance to survive. Like, who do you think wins this scenario? Fuck, Jigsaw isn't a cop. He's Rain Wilson's character from Super. He sees no distinction between being a literal criminal and cutting in line. You get the Jigsaw treatment either way. Also like Rain Wilson's character in Super, I don't remember his name so I'm just gonna commit to the bit, John Kramer is radicalized as a result of grief, by no longer feeling in control over his life and of those around him. But instead of putting the blame on the capitalist system which refuses to treat his cancer, the system which made Cecil desperate enough to rob Jill's recovery clinic and cause her miscarriage, he decides that his newfound love for torture should be used to attack the victims of capitalism rather than the system itself. He does occasionally challenge individual people with some amount of power, people who prey on the weak one way or another. But again, he ultimately treats these predators the same as their prey, in Jigsaw, the 2017 film, one of the victims put into the farmhouse trap is a thief, who accidentally caused someone's death as the purse she stole also contained the person's inhaler. Rather than giving it back, she panicked and ran. A story not too dissimilar to Cecil's. Of course, not returning the inhaler was a terrible decision. Although, what Jigsaw doesn't seem to keep into account is why this woman chose to become a thief in the first place. Because what good does teaching this one individual a lesson about stealing actually do in the grander scheme of things? It's not an issue of not knowing that stealing is bad, at least in this particular context. It's an issue of being in a living situation where you feel like the only option to survive is to steal. Jigsaw likes to end his introductory trap tapes with the words, Live or die, make your choice. 
The truth is that to steal or not to steal is the exact same choice for a whole lot of people. The same people who maybe would have benefited from more of those low-income houses Kramer was building. Jigsaw's attempt to rehabilitate this one thief doesn't change anything. Not for society, and certainly not for her, since she's the first victim to die in that nightmare barn. A fate she shares with close to every last one of Jigsaw's victims in this film. In spite of that, and in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, Kramer still has the gall to say this to Hoffman in Saw 5. If a subject survives my method, he or she is instantly rehabilitated. People with gender-neutral pronouns are fucked, though. Okay, but seriously, this is just a blatant lie. Either we never see these people who are instantly rehabilitated in the films, or they simply don't exist. Even so, it's a narrative that the media inside the world of the Saw films like to perpetuate in a, frankly, fetishistic way. Not unlike how real-life survival stories and tragedies are often sensationalized. Wow. In truth, the amount of Jigsaw survivors is seemingly so low that they fit into a single room in Saw the Final Chapter. Few of which seem to be totally fine with what they've gone through. The rest joined Jigsaw, and two of those people died not too long after. Amanda was put through three different tests, and she still resorted to self-harm by the third one. Jigsaw knows a whole lot about building elaborate mechanisms and machinery, but it probably doesn't come as a surprise that a guy who uses this skill to torture people as an outlet for his personal frustrations might not be an authority on trauma. If there were a bunch of people who hypothetically did get instantly rehabilitated, there's still dozens upon dozens of people who fail their tests and die. According to a list on MTV.com, written by Shauna Murphy, 51 people die in the Saw films. And that was before Jigsaw and Spiral came out. If you went to a rehab center where they told you that their success rate is like 5%, you'd probably want to save your money. Jigsaw's games is that rehab center. Even if his completely unfounded claim regarding its efficiency were to be true, the ridiculously slim chance of survival makes the method extremely unreliable. As I lightly touched on before, the irony of Jigsaw's individualistic view of how people should improve themselves is that there are so many examples of traps where the victims are partially or completely robbed of their own agency and bodily autonomy, or where one victim has a clear advantage over the other. In Saw 3, protagonist Jeff is the one who gets to decide the fate of almost every single victim of Jigsaw's game. Since Jeff became a pretty resentful guy after his son was killed in a car crash, and the majority of the victims are somehow connected to that car crash, all of those people unsurprisingly receive a death sentence. They die solely because Jeff wanted them to, or because he wasn't able to save them in time after he changed his mind. None of those people have any say in it. They only serve the purpose of furthering Jeff's journey of self-improvement. Their redemption is secondary to Jeff's or even meaningless in Jigsaw's eyes. In Saw 6, William, the younger man who has to compete against the older smoker, is repeatedly forced to choose between saving one life or another, in order for Jigsaw to make moral points about the health insurance policies of the company William runs. In one of the traps, William has to choose between killing an older woman and a younger man who, according to Jigsaw, doesn't have a family and wouldn't be missed if he was gone. Jigsaw puts these innocent people in a death trap to make William think about his moral crimes. I think it says a lot when the ending twist of Saw 5 is that every victim of the main game could have survived, implying how uncommon the choice actually is. Jigsaw claims to value human life, as much as he wants others to value their lives, but he sure is eager to objectify and use people as pawns whenever it suits him. It's arguable whether Jigsaw even believes his own words. When talking about his ongoing game in Saw 2, he gleefully says, Oh yes, there will be blood. He smiles when he says this. He enjoys it. Maybe he's playing it up to piss off Detective Matthews, whose child is one of the participants in the game, testing to see if he will be able to keep his cool. But he can also be heard maliciously laughing in some of the tape recordings in the film. The hint is this. It's right before your eyes. <laughs> it will be like finding a needle in a haystack. <laughs> His signature puppet has a signature laugh. And in Saw 3, Jigsaw straight up tells Jeff that he has a favorite trap. 
the device Timothy is strapped to is my personal favorite. I call it the rack. Oh, you would love the rack, wouldn't you? You dirty old b****. Jigsaw is vengeful. Despite telling Logan that he taught him not to act out on his anger, he targets people based on personal grudges all the time. He targets Cecil for causing Jill's miscarriage. He targets his former lawyer. He targets William for refusing him his health insurance. He targets Hoffman for pretending to be him. He targets the protagonist of the final chapter for pretending to have been put inside one of his traps. And he targets Logan for mixing up the x-ray that revealed his brain tumor. Not to mention every single cop who's attempted to go after him. You could even argue that he targets the people he doesn't know personally simply because he's resentful towards those who, according to him, waste what he feels he can no longer have. A life. Jigsaw is not driven by a passion to rehabilitate. At least not entirely. What he clearly wants most of all is retribution. Jigsaw is a cop. He just doesn't realize that he is. And like a cop, he upholds a system which only creates more of the problems he is claiming to solve. Whether it's Kramer working outside of the police or Hoffman working from the inside, the results are ultimately the same. The spiral pattern, another one of Jigsaw's signatures, symbolizes rebirth. But in a slightly more literal sense, it also symbolizes how Kramer, his associates, and their work are all going in circles, leaving a red, endless loop of bloodshed. When looking at how the first chapter of the series starts, and how what was originally planned to be the final chapter ends, that spiral is all I can think about. This stinky looking bathroom is the point the spiral keeps looping back to. This was where the audience first saw John Kramer, where Amanda Young was revealed to be one of his successors, and where Dr. Gordon finally puts an end to Hoffman's murderous rampage. Hoffman's own story arc is also reflected in the spiral, being a police detective basically hunting himself, a snake eating its own tail. This place represents the never-ending nature of Jigsaw's operation as much as its failure, because every time one of these characters are revealed to be or to be working for Jigsaw, they lock someone inside the bathroom in the process someone who failed their test. Even seven years after the release of the final chapter, Logan recreates this trope at the end of Jigsaw, further proving that there is no end to the spiral. And yet, there is no progress. Everyone dies. Nobody learns anything. Credits roll. The Saw films are many different things. On the surface, they're simply gross after-school specials with what appears to be some profound philosophical and political takes. Although to me, they're the story of how an individualistic view of society, how telling people that they're wholly responsible for their fortunes and misfortunes within a capitalist system, and how removing people's agency while still claiming to want to help them, can only result in an endless loop of pain and suffering. Normally, I would expect a film from Hollywood to say that politics further to the right are bad, but the liberal status quo is good. But no, these films repeatedly pull your attention to the fact that the police, the protectors of the status quo, are also pretty damn terrible. Hell, one of Jigsaw's accomplices is working for them. So does the copycat killer William Schenk in Spiral. Schenk might believe that the problem simply comes down to a couple of bad eggs, but even those who appear to be good clearly aren't enough to make foundational improvements to society. Even Chris Rock's character, the one cop that Schenk looks up to, is no stranger to police brutality. And so, in the world of the Saw films, more and more people are either killed by the system or Jigsaw, or they become radicalized and start gravitating towards Jigsaw's dogma. There are some real-world parallels for sure. Like John Kramer, there are plenty of people who react to the injustices of the world not by searching out and finding personal strength through communities and collective action, but by lashing out and reveling in the destruction of those around them and themselves. Kramer does work with other people, but he merely uses them as pawns to further his own personal agenda. Anyone with a semblance of empathy can see that Amanda Young can't emotionally heal in the type of environment he has created for her. But he keeps her around because she is the most loyal of his followers, the one he finds the easiest to control. Hoffman has unresolved anger issues, fueled by the murder of his sister, which Kramer encourages by blackmailing him into joining his world of sadistic torture, giving Hoffman an outlet to enact more violence rather than less. 
he also drags his ex-wife Jill into all of this, knowing full well that he's putting her life at risk. And sure enough, she's murdered. By his own successor. Sure, Jill didn't have to agree to put Hoffman in a trap, but the fact that Kramer even asked her shows how little he actually cares about her safety. It's clear that the filmmakers wrote Jigsaw's victims with their particularly problematic backstories in order for the audience to feel a little less sympathetic towards them. Not only making it easier to feel good about enjoying the body horror, but making it seem like there might actually be a point to what Jigsaw is doing to them. They're almost comically evil at times, like the guy who for some reason sold a motorbike with a faulty brake without telling the buyer. This is the biggest trap of all that Jigsaw is in any way right. And it's a trap people, unfortunately, seem to have fallen into. I wonder if Jigsaw stands are the same people who later became Thanos stands. The failures of Jigsaw's victims aren't just theirs. They're his. They prove the inefficiency of not just his method, but his political and philosophical right-wing ideology. I mean, it should be fairly obvious that kidnapping, torturing, and killing people is very bad. No need to make a nine-film-long movie franchise to make that point. What makes these films great is that they use Jigsaw's misguided logic to tell cautionary tales about failure both on a micro and macro level. The failure of the capitalist experiment, the failure of our protective institutions, and above all, the failure of where we put the blame. The Saw films tell us one thing, that individuals are the problem, but we can clearly see something else entirely. Even with Jigsaw dead, his work continues. Getting rid of a single criminal, a bad cop, a shady medical company, or a corrupt president Likewise, doesn't matter. Their work will also continue. The ultimate lesson these films teaches us is that the only real solution is to stop the spiral entirely. In spite of the quite bad aspects of the series, from a filmmaking and political perspective, I feel like this reading redeems it enough to be viewed as an interesting and good anti-capitalist text. Even if it doesn't do that for you, there's still the beautifully grotesque body horror. An absolutely iconic and highly memeable horror movie villain. An unforgettable musical theme. And a reminder that we can always try to do better. Spiral mostly excluded, but these films can also be really funny when they try to be. What makes you think you can't find me here? Jill, it's a safe house. Safe house. Safe house. You get it? Gibson, this was sent here, addressed to Jill. Hoffman knows our location. <laughs> also, since there's no natural way of me putting this anywhere else, Saw 6 is genuinely fantastic, and I wish a lot more people would acknowledge that. Like, this scene with the carousel trap is more well acted than the sixth film of any franchise has any right to be. Look at me! When you're killing me, you look at me! That look on his face alone. Can we retroactively give an Oscar to Peter Outerbridge for Saw 6? So, did I finally answer my original question? Is this why the Saw films are secretly great? Or is it merely how I will justify liking them going forward? Yes. <laughs> What? Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. What happened? You said you were going to explain why the Saw films were secretly great, and then immediately passed out. You mean all those great points I made were just in my dream? I mean, I don't know how great they were, but yeah. Oh, come on! Maybe we should just stop this whole thing. Yeah, this framing device is starting to feel like one of those cutaway nostalgia critic skits, and I can't stand for that. Pim! We don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else no one will come to your birthday party. Oh my god! Thank you so much for watching, and a huge thanks to all the patrons who make these videos possible. Here are some of them. Anna Day, Eben Phantom, Eliza Tantivy, Elizabeth Haste, Franz Johannes Foyle, Håvard Krugerud, 
Infernal Ramblings, Jack Lightfoot, Jesse Earl, Lesser Sage of Stars, Martha C, Mackenzie Pollock, Mechathug, Mel Gear Fox, Nichtschwert, Nick Owens, Professor Flowers, Sable Cowl, Seth Sarg, Silk Moth, TB Skyen, Tobias Matson, Togi, Yuli Troyo, Unregistered Hypercadence, and Vinders. I also want to thank Molly Noise for the fantastic soundtrack, Kiki from Transparency for the George Saw artwork, Mira Cox, John the Duncan, and Dr. Naya Later for proofreading the script, David J. Bradley for the cameo, John the Duncan, Jesse Earl of Jesse Gender fame, and the Checkpoints show for lending their voices, and Swedish Karibo for giving life to George Saw. We've worked together on a similar project once before, so it was a lot of fun to have her reprise the role of a Jigsaw-type character all these years later. Also, since I totally forgot to thank him for making the thumbnail for the last video, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Hot Cider and apologize. I feel truly awful for not mentioning him last time, so please, head on over to his channel and support him any way you can. So yeah, we did already reach the next Patreon goal, so I will actually be talking about the scary movie films in the future. I'm extremely grateful for the continued support, and I will do my best to keep it in mind while I'm rewatching these films. Wish me luck, because I think I might need it. Pim. We don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else Joe Rogan will blow up the world with his laser nipples. Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else Santa Christ will never recover from his young blood's disease. That's, that's a two for one reference to the people who know Channel Awesome stuff, so, uh. <laughs> Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else the plot hole will continue to expand. Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else the universe will fall into flux. Pim, we have to review all the scary movie movies, or else Chester A. Bum will die. Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else Doug Walker will make another musical review. Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else Elon Musk will win. Pim, we don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies. The key to defeating capitalism depends on it. Pim. We don't have much time. You have to review all the scary movie movies, or else something bad will happen. <laughs> okay, that's probably enough, isn't it? Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go and finish working on my video about all of Peanuts media before my evil doppelganger from the Mirror Universe blows up the moon.